to organization later in the morning, but I uh, first I thought I would do something different. Uh, so we're going to talk about inference, and I'm going to use that word like a statistician uses that word. The word's gotten borrowed by other communities to mean slightly different things. Um, so for me, inference is kind of the core goal. It's saying something about the world based on the data that you have. So it's not just computing a probability distribution. Graphical models and computer science literature has used it the way I think in the early days I was also guilty of that, that inference was computing a conditional probability condition on something in a graphical model. That was an inference algorithm. Um, and that's just computing a conditional probability. That, that, that can't be what you mean by inference in general. But inference is the harder problem of saying something true about the world given the data you've seen. So a classical hypothesis test aims to do exactly that. It aims to say whether something works or doesn't work. Um, a confidence interval aims to do that. It aims to say that something true in the world lies in some interval with high probability. Um, so we're going to talk about large-scale inference, and so I literally mean this challenging problem of trying to say something true about the world. Um, algorithms that just predict, which is a lot of what machine learning aims to do, is sort of on the boundary. Uh, a prediction is something that you haven't seen. It's something different. Um, but it's often viewed as kind of limited notion of inference and in that you're just trying to say something about uh, uh, one aspect of the world, what will happen next. You're not trying to say anything about the world itself, about what's kind of inside the black box. So I personally think of it as a form of inference, but uh, it's kind of on the bound. Um, so let me just mention a few things that I consider to be current challenges that I will actually probably say something about today um, in, in inference, uh, again, this kind of broad, broader notion of it. Um, and I bring them up because I think that a lot of the machine learning industry doesn't pay much attention to these things, and uh, that's a problem. As we go forward to the real world and try to really interact with real problems, uh, we have to face these things. Uh, so one of the most important ones is control of inferential accuracy across many decisions. Uh, so if I'm just making one decision, I take the output of my classifier or whatever, and I threshold it in some way, and uh, you know, it's sort of done. Um, but I don't, I rarely do that. I usually make this, use the same classifier, you know, thousands of times a day or thousands of times a minute or whatever. And I would like to ensure some notion of overall error rate over all those decisions. I mean, that's definitely not the same. There's many, many ways to approach this and some of them are desirable, some of them are not. So the classical way in statistics to do this was pretty conservative called the Bonfoni test. You would assume these are all independent and you ensure that over some set of decisions that, um, that only one error is being that only one false positive is being made. So a stringent criterion, um, write it down and work with it. Uh, but there are other approaches to it that are more realistic and um, or it nowadays widely used. So I'll talk a little bit about false discovery rates. And um, so how many of you already know about false discovery rates? Again, just to calibrate, and only about a audience. And everybody in machine learning should know what they are, just to say. Um, you know, if you're in the field at all, you should, if you don't know what TensorFlow is, you know what FDR is, that's just wrong. Okay, that's just, that just can't be. <laughs> okay, so let's make sure that everybody knows what. Um, all right, now, runtime constraints. Uh, this is another area where, you know, machine learning, I think people don't really think about this too hard. But um, so, uh, in most inference problems, you have to make a decision in a certain amount of time. So, in like in the finance world, it's maybe microseconds. Um, in search world, uh, milliseconds, and kind of human interactivity world, it's seconds, and so on. So most problems have some kind of a notion of a runtime constraint. Um, now, where we are, I think, in the field is that we don't have any theoretical support for, for imposing a runtime constraint. People will build a system, and they will see how fast it runs. Right? They will try to build it on the very fastest computer their money can afford and see if it runs fast enough. If it doesn't, Maybe they'll try to get more computers and try to parallelize in some ad hoc way, uh, or something, or they'll simple strip down the algorithm in some way, but it's just completely ad hoc at that point. Right? So we don't have a field which really has a rigorous notion of runtime meeting inference and risk. Right? So st statisticians have a rigorous theory of risk. We talk about how the number of data points impacts the risk, how it goes as one over spin or something. A dimension impacts of this, how hypothesis complexity, as of risk, and so on. Very nice, but you never see the word runtime mentioned. Okay. Um, now, in principle, that's what pack learning was supposed to be. Pack learning was exactly statistical thinking, even though the person who developed it wasn't didn't know much about statistical thinking. 
uh, but statistical thinking, keeping certain error rates small with high probability, um, and then doing that in polynomial time. Okay? But I hope you can appreciate that's of very little interest. Polynomial versus exponential in our world is not very not really linear time, sublinear time, if at all. So that theory didn't go very far. It, it, it just sort of stopped. Um, and we're left kind of still back to ad hocery. Didn't have a notion of runtime inside of her. And now, of course, the rest of computer science does aim at runtime. That's their main thing. You know, how, how long does it take to run through a spanning tree or something like that? Well, results and algorithm, trade offs, and so on. But in that literature, you never see taught discussion of risk and probability. So it's kind of useless to us. It's say things like worst case geometric error or something like that, which is very far from. Um, so anyway, I think that's just an open area. A lot of people are kind of starting to work on it. There are some approaches, but I'd say it's completely open, really, uh, how to uh, bring runtime together with risk in a kind of way. Um, I may talk a little bit about privacy. It's just kind of an example of a constraint you can impose on a problem that is real life, real world, um, and uh, but it doesn't kind of naturally merge with risk and uh, runtime considerations. How do you, um, so I will talk about scalability. That's going to be the next parts. Uh, data provenance, that's a database person's word. Um, you rarely see that in machine learning literature even discussed, um, but it really is critical. Uh, when you gather data at some point in time, you gather it for some purpose, and you do some data analysis for some purpose and publish some results, and maybe you found some features, maybe prediction predictors, something like that. Uh, you will rarely then use the model right in that moment right afterwards on that same kind of data. Okay, so think about medical problems. This is where this happens a lot. People will have run up study at some cost with a certain set of machines, you know, a number of pixels per square inch on your imaging device and you know, drug administered in some way and so on and so forth. You'll have gathered all that and then you'll aim to use it later, I mean, years later, 10 years later, where things aren't the same anymore. And so you should be suspect of that. That should increase your error bars uh, and you should know that at least. That's what's happening. Your inferences are being based on something which has probably changed. Um, and our systems just aren't built to do that. We just have our data, we have our classifiers, we don't really have a notion of provenance. Uh, so again, I think that needs to be worked on. It's maybe that's kind of theoretically striking as an issue, but it's kind of a typical database thing to work on. Can't even do some theory on it, but certainly just um, borrowing statistical strength effectively. I, I think I'm not going to talk about that at all. And then sharing data, I may talk a little bit about as well. I mean, it's, it's something that comes up in the real world all the time, where different companies have data and they don't want to share it with each other, or individuals don't want to share it. Or there's legal barriers. Um, whereas if we're able to share it, you are able to be able to perform much better than if you're not sharing. So how might you incentivize people or in, uh, administrations to share data without giving away everything, just giving away their data? Um, Okay, so I consider, you know, maybe these aren't the list of everybody's typical big ML challenges. Most of them would write down like unsupervised learning or something like that. But to me, these are ones that not just are real, but they come up in practice when I go out and do some consulting. Really, this is often the kind of problem people are asking about. You know, what guarantees can I make? What, you know, what's, what's right? What's, what's, uh, what's achievable? So, um, okay, so to sort of get you a little bit more educated in um, the inferential side of our, our field, um, I just picked two kind of sub little topics that are uh, in some ways thought experiments at Duncan. Um, they're just aimed at kind of getting you to think a little bit. So they're not necessarily something you'll run out and use, but they'll help you maybe think in this style. So how many of you already know what the bootstrap is just to get another reading calibration? Good. A much more number of hands went up there. Again, everybody in machine learning should know what the bootstrap is thoroughly. It's just one of the top five ideas you should know about. So let's make sure you all do that. So I'm going to talk about it just so that everybody knows, but then I'm going to bring up an issue of runtime, really, that is not traditionally posed in bootstrap literature that kind of allows the scientists in us to contribute to the talk. So I think I had, I got this out of order here. Let me, let me just skip ahead slides on if later. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is a little project that I did with students at Berkeley, Ariel Kleiner, uh, Bernice Arthur, and Pete Tallwalker. And uh, it aimed at uh, taking an old idea, the bootstrap, and trying to parallelize it. So this project arose, I don't know, maybe now 10 years ago, when cloud computing was all the rage. And so we suddenly had, you know, with a credit card to Amazon, we had access to hundreds of processors um, or servers instead of just one. Um, and so immediately you sort of think, at least I did as a statistician, 
uh, how am I going to use that? What's, what, why would you want hundreds of processors? You know, and well, obviously you could try to take your basic algorithm and parallelize it. Um, that's that's kind of interesting on some level, but obvious. But another way to think about it is that you can now start to do resampling-based things. And you know, the core idea in statistics, in some ways, is that you don't just do things once; you do it many, many times, and watch what happens over those many, many times. So why not just think about this as a way to resample not just one time, but hundreds of times in parallel? And you sort of get error bars on everything you do instead of just running it once and getting a prediction with no error bar. Right? So that kind of is the bootstrap style thinking. Um, so started thinking about that. And, and really, we're just kind of thinking about can we build a system like a database where every time a query comes in, an output comes out with an error bar around it. That just becomes part of people's traditional you know, way of thinking about things. Um, it's kind of more of a systems point. But as soon as we started to do it, we realized there was a severe scalability issue. So I want to talk about um, so just a little notation, let's have data X1 through Xn. Let's just assume IID for the purpose of this presentation. We can talk about non-IID later, that is very interesting. Um, let's try to estimate something based on the data. I'll call it a parameter, but it doesn't have to be a parameter. It's just a functional of the data. Let's call that functional theta. Uh, and um, it could be, uh, you know, a tail probability, um, or it could be, you know, a functional, a, a whole function you're trying to estimate or something else. But let's just call it a parameter. Right. Now, so I'm not interested in how you talk to that parameter, whether you use decision trees or neural nets or whatever. I, uh, or how fast you make that, that's not what I'm interested in here. I'm interested in assessment of the quality of that uh, functional. How good is it? Okay. So things like bias and variance might come in play here or other notions of risk. So um, often when we talk about risk in machine learning, it, we talk about it as theoreticians. Before you see any data, here's how the risk is going to go. It's going to go as 1 over n or 1 over square root of n. You know, d, log d divided by n, blah, 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 all those kind of things. Those are before you see any data. So that's an average over all the possible data you can see. It's a frequentist average. That's what's often called statistical learning theory. Um, so you don't have to actually gather data to do that. right? So a theoretician can sit down and do this kind of theorem. But after you've gathered data, you have an opportunity to give an estimate of the risk to have gathered data. Right? And so you can actually estimate the bias and the variance. In addition to calculating an estimate or theta hat, you could say something about the bias and variance a posteriori having seen data. Right? And this is, this is really important to be able to think that, that you can do that, realize that you can do that. Um, okay, and ideally, if your theory was any good, once you estimate the bias and variance, it should go down as 1 over square root of n or whatever, but you'll probably know more now. You'll have actual estimate numbers. Um, so we want to get these things, I'm going to call them psi, which are maybe bias, bias or variance or some other um, notion of risk. Um, okay, so here's the thought experiment that sort of Naaman did, if you think about statistics uh, in, in the frequentist style. Um, so as you know, there are two kind of ways of thinking about inference. One is Bayesian, one is frequentist. Um, this group would be frequentist today. Uh, so the thought experiment you do is you say, well, what, I, I did only get one data set, that's true, but um, suppose that I was the supreme being and I could generate not just one data set of size n, but I could generate multiple data sets of size n. So I could just do that, thought experiment. So if I could, I would in parallel from the underlying distribution that generates data, there is such an object, even though I may not have it in hand, um, I could generate one data set and then two data sets and then m data sets. I could do this in parallel as many times as I want, m could be as large as I want. And uh, on each data set, I could uh, calculate my estimator. And then I'd have that sort of fluctuations in that estimator. And I could put it into some formula to calculate, uh, say, a tail probability, a quantile, say, a, a confidence interval, or, or a bias or a variance. Okay? Uh, so the, if the kind of empirical distribution here of those theta hats is, is what's called a sampling distribution in statistics. And this is just you know, what the object you'd like to have. You know something about typical fluctuations of theta hat. And then if you saw a particular data set, you see a particular theta hat, you could sort of situate it relative to the typical fluctuation. Is it unusual, or would you have expected this? For some random story. Um, OK, so that's the thought experiment. Uh, um, and of course, this looks like a parallel computer. If the supreme being has the distribution at hand, he or she could, in parallel, run these procedures and learn something about the sampling distribution. Uh, in classical statistics, you often try to calculate it analytically, but there's no reason to think about it. Um, okay, so that's unachievable because we only have one data set of size n. So why is this at all relevant to the real, real statistics? Um, well, it's relevant because of uh, the glavinko cantelli theorem. So I had an underlying probability measure which generates data. I got one data set, 
So I take that data set and I form the empirical distribution. You know, I've done it here in the form of a histogram, but I form some notion of empirical distribution. Maybe I could smooth it or, or but uh, let's just have a, a form of a uh, histogram. Um, and that object is a probability measure. It lives in the space of probability measure. It's a discrete probability measure. Um, actually, if it's a histogram, it's actually a density, but let's, just, let's kind of assume the discrete version of this where I just put mass one over n at each one of the n data points. That's the object I So that is a probability measure, and uh, it as it in, in, say, variation distance, is uh, uniformly close to the underlying truth that it was drawn from. So that's the Bickel Cantelli term. So uniform in the space of all probability measures. Uh, so there's, you know, it's asymptotically true, but it's also finite rates and so on. Okay. Um, all right, so that's interesting. That's going to be close. And so therefore, if I ignore the fact there was an underlying probability distribution, and I just treat that as the truth, now I go back to the supreme beings diagram, and I mimic every step of it in exactly the same way, just plugging in for the truth this approximation of the truth that I do have, even though I have only one data set. Right? And now I do everything else the same. So I take that object, which is a probability measure, I sample from it once, twice, m times. Okay. I'm sampling from an object which is close to the true probability measure. So all those samples will be approximately generated from the true probability measure. All right. And then from each one of them, I calculate the estimator. And then I plug it into exactly the same formula and calculate my tail probability or my bias or my variance. Okay. Um, and so this is amazing in some sense why it's called the bootstrap, because you're out of one sample getting effectively the fact of having sampled times. Right? And the math here is not that difficult, at least at one level, uh, because this is uniformly close to this. So in the supremum norm, okay, in a functional analytic sense, it's uniformly close. And if all those operations are continuous in a functional analytic sense, which they aren't always, but they often are, so for you know, means and quantiles and so on, so they are. Um, if all those are continuous, you're taking something close, epsilon distance, through continuous operators, what comes out will be epsilon prime, be close. So you will get an answer, an assessment of accuracy, which is close, guaranteed, to what the supreme mean gets. So you've done your job, right? So that is the bootstrap uh, in some generality. Um, now, when you're sampling from this empirical distribution, you, you just you, you go to it, it has mass 1 over n at every data point, you sample one of those data points, and you, that, that is your first sample. If you sample again, uh, it's, it's, you're doing this IID, so you're, um, you could get that same data point again. So you are effectively sampling the original data with replacement n times. You had n data points, you sample them with replacement n times, right? and on average you'll get about 63% of the original data will appear in your resample set, and 30% will not. So some of them will be upweighted, some of them will be not sampled at all. And that's your first bootstrap sample, x star 1. But it's not the same as the original data. It's been perturbed. So. And you do it again, you get all these perturbed sets. So these are all perturbed data sets, and you will get effectively a sampling distribution. And now there's huge amounts of theory on how good that sampling distribution is relative to truth. Right? And just to say, this is not always close. There are failure modes known. It's very interesting how they occur. You can study these with higher order expansions, like Edwards expansions, and study kind of how these errors decay as a function of n. They, they create factors of 1 over n, 1 over n, 1 over n of the 3 halves, and so on. Get all those exponents and all those constants. Um, all right, so that is the basic idea of the bootstrap. All right, so um, if you have uh, ever heard it explained to you in an elementary class, you would do something like the following. You'd say, what if, I, what if my estimator is the mean, the sample mean? I'm just taking the mean of, a bunch of, my, of, all my, of, a, of a data set, right? And uh, so I report the overall mean in my data set. It's, you know, 12.5. Someone says, well, can you give me a confidence interval in that. And you say, oh yeah, there's a formula, it's called the standard error of the mean. So you go and get that formula, and what it does, it takes the sample standard deviation divided by square root of n. Right? And that is an error bar. So it has you know, coverage uh, that's provably correct. Um, now if the data were originally Gaussian, it's just exact, and otherwise it's not exact, but as it's probably. Um, so there's a formula that you can use to get an error bar. Of course, this is used all over the place and all in the beginning of time. But now what if the estimator is the median? Okay. So you know, you should often use the median instead of the mean. So if the estimator is the median, uh, there is no such formula. Okay. You, you calculate the median by sorting your data, finding the one in the middle, and suppose it's you know, 12.7. Someone says, well, 12.7 is not good enough. I need to make a decision based on this. I want to know if it's like less than 10 or not. Uh, what's, your, what's your confidence interval? 
Um, and you say, well, I don't know because there's no formula. Right? Well, that's not a very satisfying answer. Um, so what you do there is you would bootstrap. You would take original data, uh, you would sample once, you would sort the data, find the thing in the middle, and then you do that again and again, and you get a whole bunch of medians. And you would simply take the spread of those medians as your sampling distribution, and now you can report it. That's provably correct. You would have also done this for the mean, and you would have get the, get the theoretical result. Okay, everybody happy now with the bootstrap? All right, you could conceptually now use it for things like neural nets or decision trees like that. Instead of doing a neural net once on the original data, resample the data with replacement 100 times and run your 100 neural nets in parallel and get an answer with the curveball. And now you want to be careful when you do things like this. You know, there, um, uh, there are some theoretical requirements of bootstrap um, for, for this error budget to be meaningful. But at least to me, that's better than nothing, which is what we currently kind of have. People run a neural net, they output something, and they say, there's my answer. Um, now, if you're doing a problem like a vision problem, you know, and you make the wrong answer, which, by the way, happens a lot on the image net, um, lots of wrong answers come on, it, no one's going to die, right? But if you make a prediction in a medical situation or a transportation situation, people are going to die if you don't make the right answer. So you better give an error bar on that so people know it's not trusted. All right. Now, um, so, you know, be careful using the bootstrap, but also in particular, you have to worry about computational issues. So this is a resampling paradigm, um, and uh, you have to think about the size of the data set you're getting. So if the original data set was one terabyte, uh, then each resample will have about 632 gigabytes in it. Um, okay, so it's not monstrous, but it's pretty big. And um, I'm asking you in that original architecture to do this in parallel, so that's good, but I still have to put these three sample data up on the network. So I have to send 100 times 632 gigabytes up on my network, right? And, you know, that's going to take time. You know, maybe minutes, maybe hours, depending on how good your engineer is, but you have to work at that really hard. Uh, so a lot of companies aren't going to want to invest in getting an error bar at that kind of cost, and, of course, it'll just slow things down. So if you're doing Google search and you give back an answer and I want you to give an error bar and you have to wait another 10 seconds, that's just not viable. Okay. Um, so that seems to be a problem, but, but if we're – a really large data sets, can we not even do something like bootstrap? What else can we do, right? So we do asymptotic approximations, you know, there's lots of problems with those, and so So what are we going to do? Um, well, we ended up finding a new idea. And uh, um, so there was a missing slide here, but here, the new idea is, is a subsampling-based idea, right? So kind of a very natural first idea. Uh, so here's the original uh, underlying probability machine. I had a slide where there was the original uh, histogram, so that, imagine that's there. And from that histogram, I'm going to further subsample. I'm going to thin the, the, the data. So instead of a, uh, a empirical distribution of size n, I will have a smaller one of size b. All right? And think of b as like, like square root of n. So I really uh, seriously subsample. Right? Now, um, there had been an idea called the m out of n bootstrap. Uh, and there is a topic called subsampling where people did something like this. Um, they uh, calculated one subsample of size b. And now there are n choose b subsamples. And so you can do this again and again and again and get different subsamples. All right, so you can get a sampling distribution by just applying the estimator to each one of those subsamples. But the problem is that that's on the wrong scale. Right? It's on the scale of b, not on the scale of n. Right? And so b is smaller, so your error bar is going to be too big. And if error bars are going like uh, 1 over square root of the amount of data, which is a typical error bar, right? Then and you subsample by a factor of 10, um, then your error balls will be off by a factor of square root of 10, which is a disaster. Um, so the people who proposed this were aware of that, and they said, well, let's analytically correct the error bars, right? And that's not very easy to do. You can't you know, have the analysis in hand in, in some situations, right? Um, now, this is really where it kind of is interesting, because in lots of kind of optimization-based machine learning thinking, you take your original huge data set and you subsample it by a factor of 10 and you run your algorithm on that, you're probably going to get an answer which is not too far from the original. Right? Um, but here, I'm subsampling by a factor of 10, I'm running some algorithm, and I'm getting an answer which is off by a factor of square root of 10. That's, you know, that's wrong. Um, and that is the whole point of inference. It's not just an optimization procedure. It's something else. It's giving something different. It's not just a point. It's spread. And to get spread correctly, you have to work on the right scale of the original data some way, right? But the data is big, how can we achieve it? Okay, so anyway, we figured out a way to do it. Um, so here's the idea, which is that for the, by the same Glavenko-Cantelli theorem, 
that subsample data also came from the underlying probability measure. It came through an intermediate stage, but forget that. It came from the underlying probability measure, so it's a uniformly good approximation to the underlying probability measure. Now, it's less good than the full data set. We're going to have some more variability here, but it's still, that theorem still applies. So for the same reason, we can just pretend that that's the original probability measure. That's the, our approximation of what the supreme mean has. All right? And we could take that object and we could sample from it just like we did before. All right? Now we can sample from it once, just being grab one of the original data points that was subsampled. And then twice we might grab that data point again or get a different one. And we can keep doing this and we don't have to stop at B. We can keep sampling from this object as many times as we want. In particular, we can go out to scale N. So we're taking a small object and generating an effective sample of size n, but using a small object. Right? Now, when you realize that you can do that, you realize, oh, there's no point in actually writing down a big data set of size n, which would, which would flood my network. I just take my original data set now, which is a size d, and tag each one of them with a number of the number of times it's resampled. The overall object stays of size b and never got huge to flood my network. I could do a resampling now of size n on the correct scale, Right? but never creating data sets of size n. Okay, so now you can draw a picture of this overall idea, which we call the bag of little bootstraps. Um, so I think this was published maybe three to five years ago, uh, Journal of Rules of Skills Society. So you're taking your original huge data set, so think of that as a gigabyte, and you never want to transmit gigabyte set, set size objects anywhere in this, in this diagram. All right, so along that edge, we will subsample, and um, at the subsampling, I'm going to give you some experimental results here in a minute. Uh, at that scale, that becomes about four gigabytes, okay? So fast. So four gigabytes arrive up there, there's the little subsample, and now you take that object and you bootstrap it, right? Meaning you sample that with replacement n times and do that again and again and again in parallel on multiple threads, right? And for each one of those, you never got a big data set because we did this counter kind of trick. And in fact, you don't even need to do any resampling of, uh, you know, dumb resampling at all, you just take a Poisson distribution. That approximates this multinomial resample. So for every one of the B points, I just have a Poisson, zero, one, two, three, yeah. Um, all right, so I get the intermediate data sets, I get the sampling distribution, and I pop out an answer over there, my quality estimate, my bias or my variance or whatever, which is a correct frequentist estimate, just the bootstrap. Okay. Now, it's going to be noisy because it's an estimate. As, as all estimators, it's an estimate of risk. It's a noisy estimate of risk. Okay. It'll have a little bit of residual bias itself as an estimate of bias and a variance as an estimate of bias or whatever else you're estimating. All right. So like with most things, if it's got some extra variance in it that we got because we did some subsampling, you might want to think to kill off that, that variance without hurting yourself. And so you can instead, uh, you can not just do it once, you can do this many times. So you can take one subsample and you can take M1 subsamples. Uh, it's actually a copy, I did a cut, cut and paste error here. It's actually a different subsample down here. Um, and I take that subsample, I do the same thing over again. I do all this in parallel. All right, so I'm getting multiple error bars now or multiple estimates of risk. And then I combine them in some way. Maybe I average the upper and lower quantiles or something else smarter. All right, is everybody understanding that procedure? All right, this is just totally one blast parallelism, no iteration. It's from some subsamples, you resample from them in parallel, you find. So this is the map reduce paradigm. Okay, so now the questions are, we have a new idea, presumably, we didn't suspect this was new. We, there's been thousands of paper on the bootstrap. So we said, surely someone figured this one out. This is a, not a novel variant, but we went and read not all the thousand papers, but a lot of chunk of that literature, and we didn't find this idea. So it's kind of surprisingly mighty. Um, so now the questions are empirical. Does this, how well does this work? And theoretical, can you prove something about this? Um, so let me just say the theoretical one is that we were able to prove something about this. Uh, this procedure essentially inherits all the favorable properties of the bootstrap. It has its limitations, but it inherits the favorable properties. Let me just say what those favorable properties are briefly, which is that um, error bars, confidence intervals, are themselves random variables. Okay? So they have a certain probability of doing the right, of covering. Okay? So each one of those endpoints are, are error, error, have error in it. Okay? Um, now, here's one way to get a confidence interval. Use the central limit theorem. Okay? Maybe it applies in your situation. 
So you just appeal to the central limit theorem. And of course, in the infinite limit, you're getting the right, right sampling distribution. For finite n, you're not, but you pretend that you are, is the uh, bell-shaped curve. And that gives you a confidence interval, which has errors in it. Right? Now, you can quantify how big those errors in the confidence interval are. They are an order of 1 over square root of n. Right? Now, that's kind of sad, because the error confidence interval itself is of size 1 over square root of n. And the errors in the confidence interval are of size 1 over square root of n. Of course, the constant is different. It's a bigger constant for the overall error bar than for the little errors around it. But you're in the same order, which is unfortunate. Right? So that's why asymptotic error bars are kind of need n to be really large. Um, for the bootstrap, you also get these error bars which are random, and the error in the error bars is 1 over n, so much better. So that's called high order correctness of the bootstrap, um, and Peter Hall uh, had a long book about the bootstrap where he kind of proved sorts of things. Um, so long story short, the bag of little bootstrap also inherits the higher order correctness of the bootstrap. Um, so that's good. Why am I that? I know. And that's not what you guys want to be seeing. It's a difference. All right now we're back to the same, same thing. Same slide. Ah, rat. I'm seeing what you're supposed to do. I need to do a reverse of the screen. How did this happen? Huh. No better than me? No, you're not looking in the right place. I think. <laughs> now we could. Well, okay, we could go over here. All right, so maybe someone know who knows better. We'll go actually here. Displays. Arrangement. I know I don't need separate views. Just... All right, thank you. Okay, so um, let's now do something empirical. All right, so um, oh, what that? Why that? All right, here we go. So uh, I have to take a moment to set up this experiment. So this was an experiment on a quarter terabyte of data. This was a logistic regression, um, and we want to get error bars for our logistic regression, for the parameters of logistic regression. Okay, so it's a quarter terabyte. Um, so I argued that we really couldn't use the bootstrap for this because it's so, the scale it makes it too slow, right? But you can do the following thing. So this was experiments done on a parallel computer. This was on the Amazon EC2 platform, so it'd be really parallelized. Uh, and so for the bootstrap, uh, we can't just do the naive parallelize. It'll take too long. So instead, we make each, uh, each iteration of logistic regression as fast as we can by parallelizing the logistic regression, okay? So it's a gradient descent method. You just parallelize it in this kind of way. Uh, so that took some effort on the part of Ariel Kleiner, who did these experiments, uh, you know, a few weeks kind of, of debugging and writing that, but he did. And now what you did, did was to take the original quarter terabyte of data and on a central computer, sample it with replacement, put the, the sample data set up on the cloud, and let it run a very fast logistic regression, and then do that again. And do that sequentially, you're doing bootstrap now, using the parallel computer just to make the inner loop fast. All right, so that's the blue curve here. This is the uh, relative error in the bootstrap over, over time as this process is happening. So you can see it takes about, what, I don't know, 2,000 seconds to run one logistic regression at the scale. Okay? Um, and there's one logistic regression, two, three, and the corresponding bootstrap error bars are being computed and, and they're coming, uh, gliding in after about 15,000 seconds are starting to stay. So that's an example of uh, something I would consider not viable. No one would in practice wait 15,000 seconds. 
the new procedure, BLB, is right here. Uh, this was just about an afternoon's work to paralyze this on Spark, which is a platform being developed in our lab in the AMP lab where I have been the last few years. Um, and Spark was partly developed for this algorithm and a couple of other related algorithms, particular logistic regression kind of things. Um, so uh, this was just implemented at the little diagram I showed you. It's this flow diagram. There's a branching. You get multiple threads, and there's a, a subsequent branching. And the whole thing ran and finished, map, reduce, in about 200 seconds. Uh, and the error that it had was much better than the bootstrap after 15,000 seconds. Um, so that's really an impressive slide, I think. Uh, it's orders of magnitude improvement in the thing that matters, which is runtime. Uh, and I don't think this is really that special to Bootstrap. I think there's going to be lots of other inferential resampling-based ideas that can also profit from rearranging your thinking about how you should do the resampling. Not to do the naive resampling, not do the classical one, but do something that's more appropriate for modern distributed architectures. Uh, perhaps some blend of subsampling and resampling, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we posted that about five years ago. I'd say there's been a modest amount of attention, and you know, the statisticians kind of know about that. Uh, machine learning people have just yawned and moved on to deep networks or whatever. Um, but I think people need to know about this because this is really kind of what we're being asked to do. You know, give estimates of risk and be able to quantify that. So as the field goes further, I, I, I hope, hope this will have you know, hope the attention of things like this and develop other versions. You can ask, how can you do cross validation at scale? You know, that when you have exabytes or petabytes of data. Uh, and how can you make that efficient when you have processors? So, so. There's tons of good issues there that I haven't been thought about. So let me stop. That's all I wanted to say about that, and then I'm going to move on to other topics. Today will be kind of a little bit of a topic. Any questions about that? Other issues are related to, yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, my question is about uh, how, how do you how do how do you compare this with the Bayesian inference? I mean, we do somehow the same thing in, in with the Bayesian perspective. In yeah, uh, like something from our, our posterior distribution, then calculate um, the predictive posterior and um, and yeah. assess the assess uh, our uncertainty with the, the Bayesian frame. Yeah, so um, you can. I mean, those are things you can do. It's just the answers you get out don't have the same underlying theory. They don't, those Bayesian intervals are highly dependent on your choices in the prior. They aren't going to cover the truth. There's no guarantee of that happening. Um, so, um, you know, if, if you're doing a Bayesian thing where you have like a small handful of parameters where you can really assess a reasonable prior, then, you know, and you can work, it'll take time to maybe really assess that with, you know, like an expert sitting down and really think. And that's not a, a bad way to go. Um, but here we have on order 100,000 parameters. There's just no way you're going to ever sit down with an expert or anybody and assess a prior for the situation. Right? So if you're just wedded to Bayesian thinking, you're going to go ahead and turn the crank. You're going to throw down some arbitrary prior here. Right? And in a small number of dimensions, that may not matter too much to your inferences. In high dimensions, everything concentrates on a shell. Right? And the mass you're putting out at some arbitrary place is uncontrolled, right? So your error bars are completely dependent on arbitrary choices you made. Yes, you can compute them. Yes, you can run the machinery. You can subsample and do all that. But they're arbitrary answers. Yeah, so high-dimensional Bayesian, I just don't think I, I would very, very strongly caution. Uh, if you have a, a, a you know, low-dimensional prior on a small number of parameters that you know, trust and you can work at, um, you know, so I tend to be a Bayesian when I have like a year or two to work with like domain scientists and people and really look at the model and, and everything. I do not tend to be a Bayesian when I'm doing larger scale things. In particular, if I'm developing a piece of software to push out there like a database that gives error bars, and every, many people in the world are going to use it on data sets I never thought about, how could I ever say I could put priors on that? And or how could I ask them to put priors on 100,000 things before they run my software? And so what I want to do is put out a piece of software that I guarantee that as it runs, it will produce error bars that have correct coverage. I, you know, I'm both a Bayesian and a frequentist, but in this setting, I just don't I, I strongly can yeah. So um, I have two questions. Uh, in the original bootstrap, you don't need to be worried about the size of the resample, say, but here you have to be worried about the bag of the, the size of the well, bag. Well, the original bootstrap, you have to have samples of size n. Yes. But and you start with the n, you stay with n. 
Yes, but here you have to choose the size of the bag. Yeah. Get, and then yeah. Is there any optimal value for that? Yeah, no, that great question. So there are three hyperparameters here. Uh, one is the number of subsamples you take. The other is the number of resamplings you take within a bootstrap. Those, it turns out, there are good, we did a little theory, there's some kind of good defaults for that. And basically the answer is the bigger the better. It'll slow you down, but sort of around 1,000, you know, 100 to 1,000. That last parameter is B, the, the size of subsample, is a hard problem. And so it's also not solved for the um, M out of N bootstrap. It's sort of, you know, there's been some papers on it, but it's open problem. We had, our theory said that it had to be at least squared of N. Okay, so below threat squared of n, it might work, but we don't know that it'll work. And so that we want to have a guarantee. Above squared of n, we know that it'll work, uh, in, but it's still there, it's an asymptotic sense. All right, so what we do in practice is we set it to be equal to n to the 0.7. So if n to the 0.5 is guaranteed, you go up a little above that, and we did like thousands of experiments, and it was working always at that. That's not a theoretical result. That's an open problem. And it's a hard open problem. Is there any benefit of combining the, uh, the bootstrap? Um, so the, in the first layer, do some bootstrapping and then do this bag uh, or DLB on each of them. So essentially, create some of those hyperpopulations and the bag. Um, you mean the first layer, do a full resampling? A uh, couple of them, not uh, not, not a huge number. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. and then combine this is the could be, could be. I mean, I never thought about that. But, um, but yeah, there's lots of degrees of freedom here. You know, if you uh, can rearrange this competition in many ways, as long as you work at scale and effectively. So, yeah, so I, we had also thought about that you do this kind of rec in recursive fashion. You know, and uh, it's not clear you can, but it's not clear you can't. So I do this not just in two branches, but you know, multiple branches. Um, then you might be able to get beyond the square root of n barrier. But I'm not sure that's possible. Okay, anything else? Um, time series and other dependent data, um, you can think about how to do that. Can there I ask you a question? Oh yeah, please go ahead. Does your theory also cover non-IIDs? I was about ready to say something about that. So time series would be a non-IID situation. Uh, it's kind of orthogonal to everything we've done because so there exists there's you know it's been 40 years of the bootstrap there's thousands of papers and so people looked at lots of non IDs so effectively when they go to non ID you have to sort of say in what way is it non ID um, so the time series is non ID roughly speaking because you know nearby points are highly correlated and then the correlation drops off okay it's kind of a very rough modeling assertion um, so you have two choices at that point one is you can actually go more bottle based you can go more towards a Bayesian perspective if you will you make some assumptions. So you could say, well, I'm going to just model the time series with an ARMA model or something like that. And then what I will do is now I have a little generative model for data. I could then sample from my generative model. And in fact, that's called the smooth strap. Okay? So I could do that. Another way that's more non-parametric is to say, well, with, I can take a block of data. And within that block, I have lots of correlation. I don't want to destroy that. So what I'm going to do is break up my overall time series into multiple blocks. And then I'm going to scramble the blocks. Now I'm just breaking some correlations, but not too many, right? And I scramble again and again and again, and I get multiple time series that have been patched together, and I can do bootstrap that way. So that's called the moving box bootstrap. Um, and so there's all kinds of other things that are a little bit more model-based, a little less so. The simplest model-based thing is you, just, you take that histogram and you do a density estimate, smooth it. And that is itself a good approximation of the underlying probability distribution, a little bit better, in fact, right? And so I could use that. That's called smooth bias. So you get some guarantees. The guarantees get a little better there, but the computational burden gets harder because you're now sampling from a density. You have to go look at your little kernel functions to get your, your sampling. Don't just sample with places. Um, now there's lots of new interesting questions that come up. Suppose I take out my data as a graph. I think you should talk about social networks this way, right? So I have one realization of a graph of some kind, and I'd like to get error bars on quantities like, you know, the neighborhood size or the end degree or, you know, not just on the, that graph, but on the graph that it could have been, the inferential. Um, I, you know, predict whether a link is likely to be there if I keep it you know, but tomorrow. Um, that's an inferential assertion. So what's my error bar on? Uh, so what you would like to do is take that graph and resample the graph with replacement in some broad sense and do that again and again. And now you'll get multiple graphs through inference. Um, and now people are going to need to sit down and think about what does it mean to resample a graph. Okay. 
naive ways you can think about doing it. You take a node, you take all of its neighbors, you resample them with replacement, but that's just one approach. Is that going to give you the inference you want? I, it's not clear. Yeah, so a lot of this literature is very non parametric You're trying to make as few assumptions as possible. It's like, you know, IID was the kind of classical one. And everything else is just completely non parametric uh, And if you start now to get into situations where you think there's more structure in your data, you might partly model that, but partly. Okay, so there's nothing else. Let me move on. Let me go back to these slides a little bit on FDR. Another idea that everybody needs to kind of know about. Um, okay, so uh, there are lots of kind of nice tutorials about this. So I'm just going to kind of be brief, to kind of make you aware of this if you weren't already. Um, false discovery rate is um, a way of controlling errors in a classification or hypothesis testing situation where you're not just making one decision, you're making a whole bag of decisions. Roughly speaking, what it is is that you're, you're saying, um, I've just made 100 decisions. And uh, in that bag of 100 decisions, I can guarantee you that 95 of them are correct. So five of them are wrong. All right? So that would be a nice, useful thing to be able to do. I can return those 100 decisions back to somebody and say 95 of them are correct. So in a scientific setting, this would allow, say, a biologist to say, well, there could have been you know, 100,000 know, 100,000 hypotheses that I could have to investigate. And instead, this statistician is telling me, uh, here's 100 hypotheses to investigate. And after I investigate every one of them, it will probably be the case that about 95 of them were worth pursuing or spending my money. Okay? Um, so classical control would take maybe your 100,000 possible hypotheses and ensure that you only had one false positive. Right? So you're going to be very stringent. You're going to have very few positives. Just to be careful. This allows you to return a much larger bag of decisions guaranteeing that some subset of them are correct. It's like a large sum, subset. Okay? So, so the, the idea is to ensure that the fraction of errors over a set of decisions is well controlled. Um, OK, so the original literature, this started, I guess, in you know, 1990s. Um, and uh, the original literature made pretty strong assumptions of independence mainly and some structural assumptions as well. Not IAD, but independence. Um, and there's now a new emerging literature where you allow the decision to be coupled in interesting and more realistic ways. Um, so that if you haven't seen the kind of a cartoon that suggests this, you need to see it because it will make you remember this better than anything else I can say. Um, so let's suppose that somebody comes running in saying, claiming that uh, jelly beans cause acne. And uh, so some, so a boss says, uh, scientists investigate. And they say, but we're playing Minecraft. OK, fine. Um, and so they go off and do a study, and they found no link between jelly beans and acne, a P greater than 0.05. Okay? And the uh, boss says, well, that settles that. But then someone comes back and says, well, I hear it's only a certain color that causes it. So you bring the scientists back in, they do another study. Um, right? So they do uh, one study that shows that there's no link between purple belly jelly and acne. There's no link between brown jelly beans and acne, and pink, and blue, and blah, blah, blah. Okay? So they keep doing all these studies, and there's no link between any of these colors and acne. So the next day in the newspaper, there comes out a report, green belly jelly beans linked to acne with 95% confidence. So one of those studies, the green one happened to return the positive result. All the others were negative. Okay? But each one of those experiments was done at P less than 0.05, and so one of them returned the correct answer, or the, the false positive answer. Um, and so this happens all the time. You know, it's silly. In this example, but it happens all the time in the newspaper. Where people go look, looking through studies, finding the interesting ones, the cool ones. And the interesting ones or cool ones are often not interesting or cool. They're just false. It's wrong. Because if something's just totally false, it's probably pretty interesting. That's so, um, all right. So, uh, you know, again, kind of, we should have both computer science and statistics sides to our personality. If you're just a machine learning person running some piece of software and giving out predictions, you're, you're, you're going to do some danger to the world. Um, so we have to be aware that we are making lots of decisions and some of them will have consequences, and we have to be aware of things like false discoveries. Okay, so false discovery rate, what is it? It is just the expectation over the data generating mechanism of the number of false discoveries over the number of discoveries. Discoveries is just, here I claim that there are 100, uh, so um, maybe there are 100,000 you know, null hypotheses being tested. Or a thousand drugs. I'm, I'm trying to say something about. Um, and so, for each one of them, I could say yes or no. That drug works. That drug does not. Um, 
So what I'm going to do is go through all of them, and I'm going to pick out some subset, maybe 100 of them, and say, on those, I believe that it's a, it's a true positive. Okay? So I'll return all those, let's call those discoveries. Now, some of those discoveries will be true discoveries. They really are correct you know, projections of a null hypothesis, and some of them will be false discoveries, false positives. Okay? So I take the number of false discoveries divided by the discovery. Both of those are random variables. I get to choose the number of discoveries and some procedure, random, and then for some number of false discoveries, I don't have much control over, so it would be random as well. So that's an expectation over a ratio with two random variables. All right, so we'd like to control that kind of quantity. So how can you control that quantity? You want the overall FDR to be less than some 0.05 or some other number, not individual, overall FDR. So one more thing that does this is very famous, called Benjamin Hochberg, um, which is very simple to describe. It says the following. You sort in increasing order the p-values. So these, we're using p-values here. There's a lot of controversy about p-values, but that's controversy about how you use p-values. There's no controversy about that p-value itself. All a p-value is is a descriptor of a probability distribution. It's just the probability to the, to the right of a point. It's a tail probability. There's nothing wrong with a tail probability, okay? right? So, uh, so I have a whole bunch of null hypotheses. So under null hypothesis number 35, you know, I have some distribution, maybe Gaussian, maybe not. Right, and then I get some data, and I can comp compute a, a, a tail probability under that thing. It gives me a, a partial descriptor of, the, of, the, of a, the data under a certain assumption. Okay, um, so here this procedure uses p-values in a particular way. It takes the p-values and it sorts them in increasing order, and then it's going to walk along them, and so call p uh, parent k this, the k sorted one, right? And it's going to compare those p-values. Uh, to a, a function which is growing in, uh, linearly in k. So it's 0.05 times k over n. So it's just, n is constant, 0.05 is a constant, so it's just linearly growing in k. Right? And so we're going to walk along um, and find the largest k, call it k star, um, such that uh, all of the p values to the left of you are below that line. Okay? At some point you cross the line and you stop there. And so it's a very simple procedure. Sort your p-values, compare to a line, walk along, and, and reject everything below. Okay? So it's kind of interesting and surprising that that does control the false discovery rate. Okay? It is a non-trivial proof. And the original paper, the proof was actually not correct. Right. Got fixed later, but it was it, it's non-trivial thinking here. What's going on? Uh, all right, so that's been on for a while. Uh, we have just written a paper just this year which shows that this is not just a good procedure, it, that it controls the false discovery rate. You all, always try to ask also about the false negative rate. What's the power? Is this procedure not too conservative, or is it also allowing you to make lots of rejections when you should be making rejections? But really what you want us to do is ask about the sum of those two things, the false positive rate and the false negative rate. You want both of them to be small. And, and so we prove that that's true, that this thing is mini-max optimal, meaning the sum is small under a particular model, sparse IA Galaxy. So that paper just came out this year. Um, okay, so uh, this uh, lemma is really due to Aditya Ramdas, who's a postdoc in my group, who's a world expert on FDR. I've learned a lot about FDR from Aditya. And he and uh, Rena Fogel uh, uh, proved this super uniform in a previous paper that we're now using in lots of new ways. Okay, so, um, this lemma, I'm not going to really explain this too much. I just want you to be aware that it, it's here. Um, and so first of all, uh, yeah. if you look at p-values under the null hypothesis, p-values uh, have follow a uniform distribution. That's just a well-known you know, probability fact. Um, and uh, under certain broader assumptions, the, the, the null values won't be um, uniform distributed, but they'll be super uniform distributed. If you take the expectation of the indicator of the p-values being less than or equal to t, that will be smaller than t, okay, on, on average. So that's an easy proof. You can do that in two lines. For a fixed random threshold, that's just an easy fact. Under the null distribution, get this little fact. And the key idea is that this fact is true when t becomes a random variable as well under certain conditions like random variables. Okay, so I consider this a, actually a very deep result. I think it's kind of similar to something like the Neyman Pearson lemma. Um, it kind of captures the whole spirit of the literature in one little lemma. Um, so here is the result that um, if uh, f is non-increasing, so we're going to put in our arbitrary function here um, of these p-values, 
if it's not increasing and then um, uh, under certain forms of positive dependence, and the paper here has that in them, um, then we still get this super uniformity result for random thresholds. Um, so I don't want to get into details here. I just wanted this is a bit of publicity for this paper. It, it'll take some time for you to read and absorb it. Um, but just I want to let you know that such a limb exists, and it allows you to sort of turn lots of problems that uh, involve ratios of random variables and expectations into something you can actually compute. And so in lots of these proofs, you'll have to form this ratio, and you'll need to bound that. Uh, you'll need to be sure that's less or equal to 1. This, this limit just comes in and allows you to. Um, okay, so I want to give one example of doing this uh, to give you a little flavor of how far this can go. So this is an area um, that I worked in about 10 years ago. Um, the gene ontology, you may or may not know, but it's a, uh, it's a big project in the biological literature where you're trying to say something about the functions of proteins. So for every protein, of which there are, you know, hundreds of thousands, you'd like to assign it a function. Is it an enzyme? What kind of substrate does it work on? Is it a membrane protein? You know, so and so forth. The whole ontology, really, of, a, of labels you could give to proteins. And um, so, you know, um, that, that forming such an ontology is kind of half the research in this field. Um, you, you know, you want labels for data. Like, so, and the labels are not going to just be a list of labels, like in kind of our vision problems, you know, cat, dog, kangaroo. You really want to have these labels related to each other. If it's an enzyme working on a certain substrate, well, therefore it is also an enzyme. There's logical relations among all these labels. And so people then, you know, thought about this and formed a whole thing called the gene ontology, which is every node is a label, and the labels respect certain logical relationships. And the overall result is a DAG, directed acyclic. People spend enormous energy on this, and when you get a new protein isolated, you do some assays on it, you try to put it somewhere in the gene ontology. Okay. Uh, so now, if you turn this into a statistics problem, I've gathered lots of data about my protein, I've hit it with x-rays, I've you know, done various assays, um, it's now a hypothesis testing decision where which nodes to light up in the gene ontology. Okay. So it's now a whole you know, 100,000 nodes to be lit up, and some subset of them I want to light up. Okay. Um, and now the decisions aren't independent anymore. They're logically related, so it's really far from independent. Um, and so this is actually, we ran, we have an algorithm that um, falls out from that lemma. Now we ran that algorithm. It's a binyamin hochberg type algorithm, a little bit different. And uh, this is a result of the run of that. It lit up some of the things, the green ones, and um, then it had marginal values for some of the others. Um, and uh, we're able to compare with ground truth. Um, so, I'm not getting any details here. I just want to let you know this is now possible. This was not possible about a year ago. Um, so this can also be done on not just DAGs, but on undirected graphs, so like your social network sort of situation. So you can have sort of gossip-like situations where everybody in a social network is trying to decide whether something is true, or whether some rock star is going to have a concert or something like that. And so you learn from your neighbors what they think is true, and you want to overall have the graph come up with a decent this overall decision for some social um, so you can formulate that in the same way, and this the super uniform limit. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop there on that topic. I could go on, but I decided just to give make this be a little short publicity spot. So we got some. Yeah. Uh, if you do want to read up more on this, um, uh, you can either go to my website or just go to Aditya Ramdas directly. I guess I could write his name there. Full stock Berkeley. A A D I T Y A Ramdas um, has. And all of this paper I'm referencing, but a whole bunch of other papers on this topic. And that'll also get you into this whole literature on FDR. Any questions about that? Either philosophical or, or. All right. So last little bit for the morning. I guess I go till 2.30. Yeah. Um, I don't save any right data was bad. Um, OK, so I'm going to go back to optimization now. So that was a little bit of kind of two topics on inference, just to you know exercise your mind and learn about that way of thinking. Let's now return to optimization. So what I plan to do, and I guess I have another half hour now or at most, and then I have an hour in the afternoon. I'm going to do a little less math. There'll be um, you know, a couple of results on saddle point avoidance that are a little mathy, 
And then in the afternoon, I'm going to talk a little about our systems building efforts. Because in addition to kind of being a theoretician these days, I'm also kind of a systems builder with colleagues at Berkeley who really are real systems builders. And we're building a system uh, called Ray, which is kind of attempting to uh, move beyond some of the defects of Hadoop and MapReduce and Spark and things like that. So uh, for those who, who are computer scientists in the room, I think you'll find that more interesting than all these equations. All right, so let's see. What did I have? Uh, here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So slow me down uh, if, you, if you're really uh, letting it, if it's just flowing by and you're not getting it. Um, but there'll be a couple of pictures that'll hopefully make this go. So this is a very active little area. It's uh, optimization algorithms that avoid saddle points. Um, so. Why is that important? Well, if we go from convex optimization, where a lot of our theory has been done, um, to non-convex optimization, uh, you know, it could be that we could say sort of nothing. Non-convex is everything. So we, you know, we could say sort of nothing. Um, right? Well, but that's not, can't be true. Um, there's still going to be lots of topological constraints. And then we know examples like you know, tensor completion or matrix completion or neural nets where uh, you know, effective optimization seems to be achieved in these, these networks even though they are um, non-convex. Um, so one of the core problems here surely must be saddle points because I have local minima, right? I have local maxima. Surely local maxima are not a big problem. A little perturbation will come off of those. I'm not likely to call up towards them. Um, I could have lots of local minima, and that's an issue that really an optimization theorist shouldn't necessarily be a force to try to solve. If you're going to run a neural net where there's billions of local um, minima, um, you know, you're going to find one of them, and maybe you'll do restarts and find multiple ones. But you have to have some other uh, outside of the optimization story reason why certain local minima are good and why you're likely to find those. And I think that's kind of open right now, why neural nets seem to find reasonable local um, So if you're not worried about that and you're not worried about local maxima, then really saddle points are all that's left. And so what, are saddle points difficult? Well, um, so we wrote a paper this year using some, some differential topology that shows the following. That generically, you will not hit saddle points asymptotically, meaning with probability one, so I to lay the big measure, wherever I plop you down in a non-convex problem, um, you will go down and you might go close to a saddle point uh, and you might spend a lot of time there, but you will eventually get out, right? And you kind of your, your intuition will suggest this is going to be true, that a saddle point kind of has one direction to follow and you will get stuck there and never get out. Anything off of that, you'll eventually get out. Um, so that, we turn that into real math this year, with force theory. Um, but that's asymptotics and there's no rate. So you could get stuck arbitrarily long and especially in high dimensions, which is our usual interest, right? Um, and in fact, if you look at real learning systems like neural nets, uh, you will typically see they kind of come down real fast and they kind of bottom out and then there's another little place where they come down pretty fast, and, and that happens maybe several times. So what's clearly happening there is you are moving close to a saddle point. It's kind of getting you stuck for a while, and then you're moving out, and you're hitting another saddle point, and so on. So maybe there's like kind of rings of saddle points. And in fact, if for tensor completion, it's known there's a single global optimum, and there is literally a ring of saddle points around. So you're typically starting out here, you're moving past the ring, getting slowed down, and then you're going all the way into the global optimum. Um, so the question then really becomes a good theory question, which is, can we de develop algorithms that will avoid saddle points efficiently? So efficiently means a good rate, so something like the 1 over square root of k or 1 over k or 1 over k squared. Um, that's part of it, but dimension dependence critical. So for in 100,000 dimensions, and our rate of avoiding the saddle point scales as, you know, d or d squared or d cubed, that's hopeless. Okay, so a lot of people have been working on this, and here are some of the colleagues I've been working with this on, notably Chi Jen at Berkeley, leading a lot of these this effort. Um, okay, so just a little bit of notation so we can state our problem. Uh, here's gradient descent. You know, we talked about it yesterday. Uh, we're going to be talking about smooth functions, so they have a you know, Lipschitz, i.e., the gradient has a Lipschitz constant L. Um, and the classical way of talking about convergence is that we have a first order stationary point, so the gradient, the norm of the gradient is small. Okay? So you go down until you know there's not, not much gradient. That's a first-order stationary point. But that could also be true around a saddle point. 
And so this first order theory is not enough to say that you're avoiding satellite. All right. But anyway, within the first order theory, you can already state some, some theorems. And so Nesterov in particular um, you know, showed that gradient descent converges to first order stationary points. So he showed that for you know, this setting, L smooth functions, with a certain choice of learning rate, one over the Lipschitz constant, you arrive at a first order stationary point in a number of iterations, which scales as kind of the original diameter, but the key is one over epsilon squared. Right? Um, so uh, there's, now what's striking about that? First of all, one over epsilon squared, this is kind of the backwards of the, the, yesterday I was talking about K, but if you set K equal to this, that's the number of iterations, K equals this and invert, you get epsilon goes as one over square root of K. So that's the kind of style I was talking about yesterday. So this is a one out of one over square root of K algorithm. So we knew that yesterday, right? Okay? Um, now, um, What's striking about this isn't that. What's striking about this is there's no dimension dependence here. Zero. Independent of dimension. Right? And that's pretty amazing. Um, maybe your intuition suggests that, but it's kind of, gradients are not axis parallel, right? They're, they go off in arbitrary direction. So you could pick up dimension dependence. In some sense, this is why gradient descent is so popular, but also not just popular, but why it works. Because in 100,000 dimensions, there's no dimension dependence. All right, so if we're going to ask to avoid saddle points, we want something, maybe not full dimension of minutes, maybe it's too much, but something that's favorable. All right. Um, so we're going to analyze an algorithm, which is about as close to gradient descent as you can get. Uh, it's going to take gradient descent and just have a little bit of a perturbation. So it's going to do gradient descent, right? But then if a perturbation condition holds, which I'll say what it is, then you're going to take your current point and add a little bit of noise from a ball around where you currently are. So just a perturbed version of gradient descent. All right, we're not proposing this as a wonderful new algorithm. We're just proposing something we can analyze theoretically and get the dimension. Okay. Um, so we're going to ask how fast can perturbed gradient descent escape saddle points. All right, so I'm going to show you results where, where exactly those rates. Also, let me say that why, would it, why didn't we just hope that gradient descent itself would avoid saddle points? We know that asymptotically it does. That's the previous paper. All right, well, we had a follow-up paper that came later, but we kind of knew this was going to be true, and eventually it got around to proving it, that without the perturbation, you do not escape saddle points efficiently. Right, you can have exponential dependence on dimension. Okay, so the perturbation, some form of perturbation is actually necessary and sufficient. Okay, so let's set up the necessary structure. So first of all, we're going to have to make a little more assumption about the function. We need it to be Hessian Lipschitz, i.e., if you look at the Hessians at two neighboring points, they're upper bounded by a Lipschitz constant rho times, times the form x1, x2. If you didn't have this, the Hessian can change wildly in a neighborhood. There's no and so you keep this. All right, so we're going to also now define a second order of stationary point, and this is due to Nesterov and Poliak. Uh, we, all, we still we continue to ask for the first order condition, but we also add the minimum eigenvalue of the Hessian be bounded below. Okay, so if that bounded below was zero then we're literally uh, insisting that we don't have a negative curvature direction, we don't have a saddle. Or we're giving ourselves a little slot, just like we did in the first order definition, that it has the epsilon in it, but also a new prime. All right. Um, so how could you avoid saddle points? One way would be that you would calculate the Hessian wherever you are. Right? If I calculate the Hessian wherever you are, I could identify the directions of positive curvature, where I don't want to go, and the directions of nerve negative curvature, which would take me out of the saddle. And I can just head out fairly, fairly quickly. So people have worked on algorithms that do that. You make the assumption you have an oracle that gives you the Hessian, and then you calculate the rate. This is interesting and non-trivial. So I'm going to give you some examples of doing it. But in high-dimensional problems of the kind that we're kind of interested in, you don't really want to have to calculate the Hessian okay, and find its eigens. Um, all right. So um, we have worked on this. Uh, we have shown that this. Perturbed gradient descent, so no Hessian needed, Hessian free, uh, under this situation with a certain same learning rate, you find, in fact, an epsilon second order stationary point in a number of iterations which, which remains epsilon squared. Dimension dependence is hidden in this tilt. Okay? So I'm going to show you what that is here in a second. But basically the result is it's the same as that the saddle points don't exist. Okay? So that is powerful and surprising. Um, now, what is the dimension dependence? All right, so here I'm going to take a minute to, to do this, this slide. Um, so um, let's uh, first of all look at some of the classical results. So Nestor and Polyak were among those who studied the case where you allowed yourself a Hessian. 
In that case, you can get this to be better. It's not epsilon squared, it's epsilon to the 1.5. That's a bit better. Okay? And there's no dimension dependence whatsoever, but you, you have pay, pays the cost of having a Hessian for which you will have to pay dimension dependence for per iteration. Right? Um, going up now to here, um, the, some early work in 2015, um, you know, this is all of developing literature, but Gu et al. analyzed gradient descent, and uh, they were able to show that it goes as a polynomial in D, which is the dimension over epsilon. Um, so that was already interesting that it wasn't exponential. That was a nice, important paper, but it wasn't exponential. But polynomial in D over epsilon is not very satisfactory. It'd be epsilon to the 45th and D to the 77th. You know, it'd be, it'd be not good. Um, so there was a, a paper by Levy uh, just a year later that separated the two out that showed that it was uh, D cubed. You know, again, not very satisfying. Um, and then polynomial in one over epsilon, so that's a bit of an improvement to separate the two out. Um, but this paper that I'm referring to now uh, with these co-authors has brought it down to epsilon squared, which uh, we believe is optimal, um, and then has brought it down to log to the, the polylogarithmic dimension, so log to the fourth. Um, and that becomes, I, I would argue, satisfying. Because logarithmic dimension is about, I don't, I don't think you could make, this will not be dimension free, I believe. Um, and so getting it to, log, to the logarithm, it, you know, beyond even the third down the logarithm is kind of satisfying. Now, is that four real? Probably. So probably a further analysis, we'll get that four down to something else, and I'm sure some will do that. Maybe us, but some will. Um, all right, so that's where we are. This is, I think, pretty satisfying. It shows that just a perturbation on gradient ascent will get you past this out. So, oh, very interesting. Now you can look at other algorithms. But this perturbation thing, I actually I didn't say much about what you add. Noise from time to time. So if you, um, if the gradient is small, you add the noise, right? But then you wait, there's a period, a blank period, where you're not allowed to add any more noise. So that's the perturbation. So you can imagine other ways to do that that are more kind of purely stochastic gradient descent. Um, and there's ongoing work on that. Um, just a little bit about the proof here. It actually is interesting. It, it does a little bit of novel differential geometry. Um, it basically analyzes uh, the topology around a saddle point, and it shows that generically, saddle points have a kind of a pancake shape, um, which uh, is thin enough that if you randomly perturb, you're very unlikely to stay uh, parallel to the pancake. If you're already in the pancake, you're very unlikely to stay in the pancake, right? Um, that means that if you randomly perturb and you're in this pancake, that you're very likely to get out of it a little bit. And then once you're out of it, uh, the drift of the kind of the power method underlying this will then carry you away from it quickly. All right? And that is a fact you can analyze as a function of dimension. So a bit of perturbation is all you need to see. That's all I wanted to say about that. That's an ongoing, again, a little bit of advertisement, if you will, but uh, entree into a literature which has got about maybe 10 or 20 people worldwide in it that are working on it. Um, but I consider it kind of the core of the uh, convex self fiction. I think Sue Reed probably talked about things too. He's one of the people who contributes to this whole area. But it's just emerging. So if you're interested in getting into something that's just emerging, uh, that's definitely fine. Yeah. Um, could you say that um, if you do stochastic gradient descent, it's kind of some putting some noise in? Yeah, you could, and, and um, uh, intuitively, uh, it would fit our kind of perturbation condition. Intuitively, it will have a rate which is one over epsilon squared. I'm almost sure that's true. Um, I do not know what the dimension dependence would be at that point, um, but these are all intuitions. So when one will need to, then this is kind of something that I know people are working on right this moment. I suspect within a year we'll have some papers on. But still, it seems that it's not exactly the same than saying that you put uh, totally random noise because yeah. I mean the, the, the direction of your of your stochastic gradient will still be correlated with the direction of the of the, of the true gradient, which means that probably this analysis would not go through. No, not exactly this analysis, but it's not that's correlated with the true gradient. That's not necessarily a problem. Um, it's really that there's enough high probability that you're uh, outside of that pancake. Um, so you could have, there's different forms of stochastic gradient. One of them is there's an underlying population, which is generating the data. The other is it's a finite sum. You're just randomly taking one of the objects. So those usually require different analyses, and I'm sure they would here as well. 
but absolutely it's something to be worked on. Because I, I, th I don't think in practice I would want to do this perturbation out. I think I would. Odd, and I, since I'm already going to do stochastic gradient probably anyway, um, I, I won't hope that it just delivers the result for me. But that analysis hadn't been done. So how can we choose the scale of perturbation? Um, you can look in the paper. It's just done. Um, it's kind of part, of part of the real details of getting it correct, uh, that you choose the scale of perturbation so that you get the log over four. Log, log over four. And um, is it computationally expensive? No. It, it is a little very easy. But it really, that, I don't think of this as an algorithm I just propose that you use. It, it should, it's an algorithm that you should ingest, understand that you can analyze it, and, and, and do other analyses in this style. Um, and because in the algorithm there is a relationship between that magnitude of the perturbation and the dimension dependence, if you just understand that as a kind of theoretician, you could design other algorithms that get, achieve the same result but without actually that style. So again, I, I just want to, this is not, I'm not proposing that you should be using the algorithm, but that you should learn what it's, how, how it's it, it's a proof. Okay, uh, all right, last a little bit. Again, it's going to be just a short, oops, sorry. Okay, um, so um, last little bit about kind of theory of optimization. There's a bunch of work on variance controlled methods. Uh, so how many of you know what about SVRG or SAG or SAGA? Okay, good, again, about a third. Um, so uh, this is kind of novel to the machine learning literature, I, I guess. I don't think of that much as novel to the machine learning literature. Also, all the ideas that you've been hearing about this week were really developed outside, you know, by optimization theorists, control theorists, statisticians. So machine learning people kind of bring them in and bring them together. Um, but, you know, there's now so many people working with machine learning hats on that new ideas are coming out. Um, and so here's one, which is uh, if we're doing gradient descent we know that we can achieve a rate which is one over, say, k in this smooth situation. And uh, I mentioned that for stochastic gradient, that rate is poorer. It's one over square root of k. That's an existing known result. And that would suggest that stochastic gradient is not a good idea, that the pure gradient is faster. And that's true in terms of rate. All right. But as you I presume we all know, the um, per iteration complexity of getting a full gradient is terrible. If I have 100 billion data points, to get a gradient, I have to go through 100 million operations to get a full gradient. And so that means each iteration is going to take forever, uh, and then I take a step, and then I take forever, and I take a step. The number of steps is small. It's going at 1 over k, but each step is so expensive that it's the overall thing is it's, it's hopelessly slow for big problems. So category, gradient, on the other hand, each step is just you look at one data point or a mini batch, and that could be blazingly fast, and then you make a step, and then you do that, so you make much more quick progress. The overall number of steps is not so good. It's one of square k, um, but each step is so fast that the overall thing is faster. So this is, in some sense, an empirical discovery over the years in, in you know, neural net literature that this is a, this is a phenomenon. Um, so uh, at some point, someone had the idea, and I think this is Francis Bach's group at Paris really kind of got this started. Uh, they had the idea that uh, maybe it's possible to get the best of both worlds. So maybe it's possible to um, do variance control because what's happening in the stochastic gradient set situation is instead of getting the true gradient, it's getting this noisy thing, and that turns you a little bit more into a random walk. You're in a more really kind of diffusing down instead of heading downhill. And random walk, prop, you know, kind of movement, it goes, you know, like running in motion, it goes this one over square root of some result. So we didn't expect to get downhill very fast if we're stochastically getting bumped around. Right, so one way to uh, get speed up there is to take those stochastic gradients and smooth them. Okay, so do some kind of a variance control, not just literally smoothing, perhaps, but other sort of variance. Control. Um, cut down the variance, and maybe you'll be able to down faster, and maybe you'll do it at a cost which is more similar to stochastic gradient for iteration than full gradient. Okay, so um, they realized that that this could be analyzed in the setting of 
cost functions, which are a sum over, say, data points, uh, these composite objectives, and not in a general setting of just a general context F. Right? So N is now has this important role as a number of data points parameter. It's complexity of the problem. And so we'll just set up a little bit of notation here. Again, I don't want to do too much here. I've got like six minutes left. Um, we're going to assume Lipschitz in the gradient, sorry, just Lipschitz period of the function. And that's a strong convexity parameter, which could be zero if you don't want not strong convexity. Um, so these are kind of similar notations you've seen the same before. We're going to co count computation complexity in some particular way. Every time you see a function value in a gradient, that's one unit of cost, and we want to uh, bound the amount of cost to achieve some epsilon value. So, all right, so here is this algorithm, which I, it was kind of the second wave of activity on this. Uh, Johnson and Zhang uh, called it uh, so SDRG, Stochastic Variance Reduction Case. Um, all right, so it has a, this is one iteration. So in one iteration, um, uh, so there's outer iterations and inner iterations. This is one outer iteration. So um, you set i to be uh, 1 through n, right? And then you uh, calculate a full gradient, g. So that's a costly operation right there. So flag that in your mind. Number two is going to cost you, say, 100,000 operations if you have a data set of size 100,000. But you're going to do that from time to time. So you, you calculate a full gradient, and now you go into an inner loop where you're going to do this a random number of times, which is a uniform between 1 and, 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 and n, all right? Uh, and so a, a random number of times, you're going to pick one of the indices, and you're going to do gradient descent, where your step is not just, if that weren't there, you'd have just graded, classical gradient descent, the gradient at the current point. And instead, it's minus, and I mean, you could group these together, f prime at x naught minus g. G was a gradient evaluated at x naught. We're looking at the stochastic gradient also by the way there. So this difference uh, would be kind of a controlled gradient where you subtracted off something that everybody has in common, All right? So by doing that, you've cut down on the overall variance. And the variance among a group of points is being cut down by centering them around a, a, a bit, All right? So you do that, you subtract off, you, you, you recenter, and then you take a step. And you do that again and again and again in a loop. And then you go back to the outer loop, and you reset and calculate a brand new full gradient. And then you do this again. Okay, So it's an interesting algorithm. You could have proposed this for some ad hoc purposes and tried it out or anything. But they proved something about it. And in fact, they proved that it achieves the fast rate 1 over k. But it has at least some of the advantages of stochastic greening in that all of these steps are blindingly fast. And the, call, the gotcha, though, is that that step is not, and that is such a bottleneck that this algorithm is, I would say, probably not being used in practice, not much. And maybe people in the room correct me whether it started. Um, anyway, uh, as a theoretic, theoretical work and probably in the future practical line of work, this is very interesting. So we talked about some of these results yesterday. Um, this is now in this epsilon notation instead of k, so it's the inverse of k. So accelerated gradient goes as 1 over squared of epsilon, which is in yesterday's notation 1 over k squared. And stochastic gradient is 1 over epsilon. And in the strongly convex case, by the way, I, as I mentioned yesterday, you get these exponential rates uh, where you have logarithm of 1 over epsilon. Um, I don't think I had anything more. This was just background. OK, now this is the main slide here for this part of the talk, um, which is here's, this is now copying stochastic gradient again. All right. And here's our new algorithm. It's called stochastically controlled stochastic gradient. And all it is, I'll show you. In fact, I might as well just show you. All right, here's the algorithm compared to SDRG. So what it's going to do is going to, it's a subsampling based algorithm. So it's going to pick a subset of size B, where B is going to be small. All right, and then it'll calculate a full gradient on that small subset B. So that gives you, again, some variance control, but it, it's a little more stochastic. So you have to control that in theory. Um, and now, in the inner loop, we're going to generate things not from a uniform random variable, but a geometric random variable. And that turned out to be really important. Um, they, they, that gives the, re the result that without the geometric is the point. And then everything else is the same. You do gradient ascent on a stochastic gradient, where the resetting gradient is, uh, is itself stochastic. So stochastically controlled stochastic gradient. Okay? So pretty natural algorithm. It can be made to run much, much faster than SBRG. So let me now go back to the theory. So here's stochastic gradient. Um, SDRG has a complexity, which is also 1 over epsilon squared, but it also has a factor of n, because from time to time, you have to go through the whole data. Right? Well, we have a factor of n here, too, but that's a minimum sign. Right? So as soon as n gets it all large, the minimum is this. 
And so the, the dependence on n vanishes, right? Completely vanishes. Okay. Um, we also have another version of the algorithm, which I won't get into, but it has a logarithm of n over n, so even, even more favorable for uh, vanishing of the effect on the Okay, so that's really all I want to say. I think I have a summary slide. Um, so this is also an ongoing line of research. Uh, there's, again, there's maybe 10 or 20 people worldwide working on this. Um, considered it's extremely interesting and important how to do the best of stochastic algorithms and also full rating algorithms. So when you start to see these kind of results, you realize this field is by far from done. So not, it's not a completed field that I'm delivering to you. Um, these things are lots of open questions. How do these things go when you make them distributed asynchronous? How do things go in the function of dimensionality? What if you're doing constraint problems? Uh, what if your constraint set is kind of a conic set or something more interesting than, you know, Euclidean space? What about on manifolds and so on and so forth? So I'd say it's like most of these questions are not known, but there's a style of approach to them, which is you, you can learn. And it's like, you know, perhaps do six months or a year, you can learn this style. And, so, um, so let me finish with that. Again, my afternoon, I have another hour, will be devoted to systems kind of stuff and more, and, and not so much equations. Questions about that? Okay, lunch. Yes, that's good.